the next generation uh, of farming uh, and the next generation of food, the next generation of agriculture, um, is what we're all about here. It's not just those of us who are here today, it's the people who will come after us uh, tomorrow, our children, our grandchildren. That's what we're talking about here today. Um, and when we talk about that, it's inescapable uh, to talk about climate change. Um, last year, we had the starkest, uh, the most serious uh, report that I've ever seen uh, in, on climate change from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which has been doing its work uh, since 1988. Um, and in that report, the IPCC warned very clearly uh, that global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels would be, in effect, disastrous. Uh, we will see uh, not just sea level rises, uh, not just the die-off of, of coral reefs, uh, effects that we already knew, um, but we will see very serious effects on extreme weather. Uh, we will see more floods, uh, we will see more droughts, uh, we will see more heat waves, uh, we will see more variability in weather. Uh, the wet areas of the earth will get wetter, the dry areas will get drier. Things will become much more unpredictable. Um, and because our farming systems have grown up uh, over millennia uh, to rely on a degree of, of predictability, um, that uncertainty that's coming because of climate change is going to be very, very difficult to deal with. Um, we've heard from the IPCC that we have essentially uh, 12 years uh, to get this sorted out. If we haven't got over the, the peak of emissions in the next uh, 12 years, if we hadn't managed to start bringing down greenhouse gas emissions, then we will be in serious trouble. Um, last year at the UN Climate Summit uh, in Poland, uh, we had Sir David Attenborough, uh, who is one of the most respected uh, broadcasters and natural historians on the planet. Uh, he said, and I'm quoting, our greatest threat in thousands of years is climate change. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. That means that even if we started today, we would need to cut emissions by 5% a year in order to get anywhere near uh, some kind of stability. And of course, land management has a primary role to play uh, in tackling climate change because overall land management is responsible for about a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions. Land management alone uh, will not be able to save us, but obviously it is a key part of the picture. And sometimes it's a key part of the picture that isn't always taken into account, uh, certainly not always in the United Nations negotiations, which have tended to focus on other areas. But it will become more and more important, particularly as we manage to bring down emissions in other areas. Anyway, that's where we are. Um, and I'm going to introduce uh, a panel now uh, where we're going to discuss this and uh, where you will have your chance also to ask questions. So um, I'd like to start inviting uh, my panellists uh, on stage. I've got... Um, sorry, let me just uh, bring them on. Um, if I could invite uh, Daniel Callejo Crespo uh, on stage, first of all. Um, and I'd like to... Let me take you over here. <coughs> I you're think you're here. Um, you're the director general. Uh, d sorry, the director general of the uh, uh, Environment Directorate at uh, the EU Commission. Um, and then I'd like to ask: uh, Have we got uh, Philippe Lambert? Sir. Hello. If you could come on stage, thank you. We weren't sure if you'd arrived for a while. Um, Monsieur Lambert is the co-chair of the Greens in the EFA group in the European Parliament. Um, then I'd like to ask uh, Leslie Rankin, who's the uh, researcher for the Institute for Public Policy Research uh, in the UK. Uh, and 
Finally, I think we've got Jean-Marc Bournigal, is that right? Who's the Director General of the Wheat Producers Association uh, and is based here in Brussels, I think. Um, these are our panelists and uh, very expert they all are. But we've just heard uh, from the Commissioner what the European Union is doing uh, in terms of tackling climate change and the importance of that for food and agriculture. Um, I'd like to invite each of you to respond to that and to tell me how, uh, as the European Union, we can respond uh, to the threat that we have been posed. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Fiona, and good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. And I think Mr. Commissioner Arias Cañete has presented in a very comprehensive way what is the strategy of the EU, both for climate, for energy, and also the key role of agriculture. And I think we are all aware in this room about the links between agriculture and the environment. It is clear that agriculture contributes to climate change. We are speaking about 10% of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions. It is true, we have managed to decrease them between 1980 to 2011, 23%, but we are struggling to achieve further reductions. The commissioner was mentioning this issue. But at the same time, I think one of the important messages is that agriculture can also be, it is one of the victims of, cl of climate change, but it can also help us to mitigate the impacts of climate change. And so what the European Union is trying to do through the reform of the common agricultural policy is to use it as a tool that can go in the right direction. The agriculture and the environment have to look in the same direction. We have to find win-win solutions because nobody is more interested in having sustainability, in having uh, the soil in the right condition than the farmers themselves. So what the European Commission has proposed in its proposals is a number of tools to promote these more sustainable practices to promote landscape features, which have a positive effect on biodiversity, on soil, on water, but that con can contribute also to carbon storage. Incentive, incentives to maintain and increase permanent grassland at farm level. This can be very beneficial because both for biodiversity and for climate, they can be considered as remarkable carbon sinks. And also good farm management practices the optimization of fertilizer, application rates, environmentally friendly farming, agroecology, organic farming, conservation agriculture. Through the new delivery mode, it is true that member states will have more flexibility in preparing their strategic plans, but it is also true that we are asking the environmental authorities to be involved and that we are linking the practices to results results in the area of nitrates, of biodiversity, in Natura 2000, on water. There has to be a closer link between the way the agriculture is performed and the links to the climate and environmental objectives. Because it has been said, we have very little time to act. The sense of urgency is there. And we will not be able to succeed if we do not reform the present common agricultural policy and we make it more sustainable. And this can be a win-win, a win for the environment, but also a win for the agriculture. And this is not just an environmental speech or an environmental message. We have seen the statistics. And the statistics say that two-thirds of the farmers agree that we need to do things more efficiently and that the common agricultural policy should do more for the environment. 64% of the farmers and 92% of non-farmers think that it is possible that the common agricultural policy should do more for the environment. But it is not just a question of thinking. It's a question now of acting, of taking, of taking decisive action, and the proposals which are under discussion will be critical because we are talking about the 2021, 2027 period, and after that it will be too late. So now it's the moment to act. Hang on a minute. I thought the last reforms of the common agricultural policy were supposed to refocus us on the environment. But they have not been sufficient. 
when you see the loss of biodiversity, when you see the situation that we have, we need to increase the pace. We will not continue with business as usual. We will not be able to deal with the challenges we are facing. We are reaching the planetary boundaries in biodiversity, in the soils, in the loss of biodiversity. So there is a need to step up action and agriculture can play an important role. And this can also be, because the main beneficiaries of this will be the farmers themselves. Because by being more sustainable, they will be able to perform their activities in a more durable and in a more sustainable way. But how can we be confident that these reforms will be better than the last reforms? We cannot be confident. It is the responsibility now of the institutions, of the member states, of the European institutions, of the citizens. It is the individual responsibility of each and every one of us and of the farming sector to go in this direction. We can be confident that if we act, if we change the way we are doing things, we can become more sustainable and we can meet the challenges. But we, cannot, we have also to tell the truth. And time is running out and we need to step up action. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Lomir, I'd like you uh, to address us, please, on uh, what your reaction is to the Commissioner's speech and to what we've just heard. I had to struggle uh, against falling asleep. Welcome to my hometown, Brussels. Brussels has today one of the worst air quality episodes of the last few years. Why is that? Traffic and agriculture. The combination of NOx from cars and NH3 from fertilizers produces this. Do I see, do I see in what Commissioner Cagnete was saying, yeah, sorry about this, uh, do I see, come on, uh, do I see Wake up call. a change of paradigm? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad. Uh, do I see a paradigm shift? Absolutely not. You're talking about sense of urgency? What sense of urgency? I mean, do we move away from a production-oriented and fossil-oriented agriculture, well, common agricultural policy? The answer is no. We are tweaking at the edges, no discussion about that, and we have been tweaking at the edges for decades, but the core of the system remains production-oriented, geared towards the global markets. Just a question by show of hands. Who believes that we are not eating enough meat in Europe, here, in this room? Okay, who believes that we are not producing in Europe the meat that we need, that we want to eat in Europe? Okay, tell me then, because CAP is only one side of the equation. Let me talk to you about another side. CETA, big victory for the Canadians. They have won a quota in order to export meat to Europe to the tune of 120,000 tons a year. What does that do to the environment? So it's not just common agricultural policy, it's trade policy, it's the internal market, it's all these things, structural funds. Are we geared towards carbon neutrality in 2050? Well, if I listen to Commissioner Cagnete, everything seems to be fine, we are on the way, uh, so trust us and go back to your occupations. We're doing the job. The answer is no, we are falling far short. Because the thing is that if you really want to address the root problem, you have to have a paradigm shift. You have to rethink agriculture in terms of ecosystem services, of local, well, shorter supply chains. And basically, yes, the purpose of the cap must be that Europe feeds itself. We don't care about feeding the global markets. That's not the point. That's not the point. What's the point in importing milk powder out of New Zealand? New Zealand, you, you can't go any further because if you go further, you're getting closer to Europe. I mean, what's the point? What's the point? Who is questioning this within the European Commission? Who is questioning this? Well, some are in the Council and Parliament, but I can tell you we are a minority and we will see where the cap reform goes but at the moment, at the moment, I'm not optimistic. Because again, the sacred cause of global trade, of, well, bigger machines, more automation, bigger farms, is still the dominant paradigm. And unless we see a change there, don't expect, don't expect that we will drastically 
reduce the emissions of the sector. And again, it's not just about CO2, it's NH3, it's all forms of pollutants that we see if the birds are dying away, if the insects are dying away, this is not by chance. This is not by chance. And most of those chemicals that we're using are, by the way, derivatives of oil. So unless we have a, a shift away from that model, don't expect us to meet the targets that we need to reach if we want to ensure survival of humanity on this planet. Thank you. Thank you very much for those trenchant uh, observations there. <laughs> Thank you for that contribution. Um, Leslie, uh, as I said, Leslie Rankin is a researcher at the Institute for Public Policy Research, and I think you've recently produced a, a study uh, looking at some of the shifts that need to occur in our attitudes to climate change and how we actually act upon them. Um, thinking of what the Commissioner said and thinking of the theme that we're looking at today, how do you see these shifts occurring? Yeah, thank you very much, Fiona, and thank you very much for, uh, to the FFA for hosting me today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, as Fiona said, um, I co-authored a report in February called This is a Crisis Facing Up to the Age of Environmental Breakdown, so that'll be the, the theme of my comments today. But I'd like to go back to um, Yanis's speech at the beginning of um, this morning, looking at the, the urgency of the problem, and I'd really echo that sentiment. If we're not, if we're not sleep, sleepwalking <coughs> um, over a cliff, we are at least behaving uh, like we are. Um, our current systems are not working, and we need to um, wake up and uh, change the rules. We need to um, decarbonize by 45% by 2030, as we've all heard from the IPCC last year. But the window is rapidly closing to avoid catastrophic outcomes for both natural and human systems. And I think that graph of um, uh, increasing greenhouse gas emissions and all the trajectories of our current policies, no policies, a two degree um, trajectory and a 1.5 degree trajectory, like for, from my point of view, I think that's the most important graph in all of human history. I mean, it really does tell us everything we need to know about the, the track that we're on for future generations and the one that we need to be on and the massive gap between them. Um, as the UN Secretary General said last year, we face a direct existential threat and we still lack the leadership and ambition to do what is needed. So we've got this um, massive gap um, and um, uh, we've heard some ideas of how to do that specifically uh, in the agricultural system. But um, I want to just um, take a step back for a minute um, and look at um, environmental breakdown in, in the round. Um, and as James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So to that end, I think we need three shifts in understanding. Firstly, we need to better understand the severity and pace of environmental breakdown. So this is not just climate change, as we've heard, it's the, it's the whole environmental system. Natural systems ranging from land use to biodiversity and ecosystems, mm -hmm. um, phosphorus and nitrogen cycles, freshwater use, um, and most of these um, systems are not doing well because of human activity. Um, the second uh, shift in understanding that we need is understanding of the implications of this for human systems. So from um, localized uh, direct um, environmental impacts to um, global systemic consequences interacting with existing um, social and economic contexts. Um, uh, these um, environmental impacts really do threaten the preconditions of our societies to um, flourish and continue how we'd like. Um, and the third shift in understanding then is the need for um, a socio-economic transformation to a society that is sustainable, just and prepared. So sustainable, so we're living within um, planetary boundaries, the safe and just operating space for humanity, just because we need to um, improve living standards and provide a high quality of life for all while reducing inequalities. I'm prepared because, well, as we've seen, some um, environmental um, degradation and impacts is, is now inevitable, and we will also probably um, uh, um, reduce our emissions and other um, uh, damaging impacts um, imperfectly. So we need to be prepared for the impacts of past action and um, f uh, future action. Um, and all of this needs to um, be engineered <coughs> around um, young people and future generations. So I'm a massive fan of the um, 
theme of this conference and inspired by recent um, political action of young people who are showing like um, who are showing massive moral leadership and I think that's fantastic it puts the rest of us to shame a little bit I think um, but we need to um, think about two aspects of um, the challenge faced by young people one is if um, we if, if every generation of leaders, decision makers and politicians goes through an informal and formal learning process of um, getting ready to become uh, leaders and be in positions of power, um, the, uh, le the lessons that um, millennial generation is currently learning um, will not be fit for purpose by the time they reach positions of power. So we'll be reaching, um, we'll be experiencing um, the real impacts of environmental breakdown. We're seeing some now, but um, we'll really start to feel it by the time that millennials come into positions of power and the um, learnings and experience and knowledge that they will have um, learned in their careers um, will not be sufficient for this new domain of risk where risk um, is um, systemic, non-linear and compounding. Environmental breakdown is a risk multiplier. So everything that we're currently experiencing in terms of social justice problems globally, um, these will be um, multiplied um, when millennials come to take power. And so I think um, that leads me to the second um, way that we need to be uh, helping um, young generations, millennial and future ones, um, is to um, support them to learn as much as they possibly can to be ready to face these challenges by the time it comes for us to take the reins. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much for that. That's been very useful. Um, now I'm going to move on to Jean-Marc Brunigal, um, who of course is, uh, as I said, Director General of the AGPB, the uh, Wheat Producers uh, Association. From your point of view, are we doing enough to tackle climate change uh, and what should we be doing? Well, thanks, for, first of all, for inviting me to participate in the AVFA. It's a privilege. and. Uh, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I have maybe a, another part to play in this panel, is try to, to explain the position from the farmer side. Uh, there is quite a misunderstanding sometimes uh, with the public and the policy makers about what should be the goals uh, for agriculture if you take it on climate change. As it has been said, it is clearly that, of course, agricultural sector, sector contributes to the greenhouse gas emission between 10 and 10 percent, it is quite clear, but it is also uh, with a forestry uh, <clears throat> part of the solution because it helps to minimize the climate change because uh, it, uh, it has the possibility to, uh, to increase the sequestration of carbon with a carbon fund. If you just take into account, for example, with a yield in France, uh, if I take only to account the wheat production, uh, the grain production captures seven times more carbon than it emits uh, in France, so it has to be taken into account. It doesn't, of course, prevent agricultural sectors to adopt actions in favor of mitigations, and it has been already said by the previous speakers. You have three main leverage, of course, reducing gas emission, essentially methane for livestock farming, but, uh, and also uh, nitrous oxide and uh, CO2 for nitrogen fertilization. You have many means then, to go down this way, for livestock farming, you have to improve the quality of uh, animal feed, the genetic selection, the improvement on the microorganisms involved in the digestion process. And concerning nitrous oxide and CO2 from nitrogen fertilization, we can use inhibitors, we can use injection system, control of doses with uh, decision-making tools. So we have many ways in order to reduce emissions, and for that we need, of course, to implement innovation systems. The second way is to maximize the role of agriculture as a carbon sink, which is very important. And the best tools are increasing yields to increase soil residues. You know that the initiative 4 for 4,000 that have been launched at the world level in order to help to say that if we go to more sequestration of carbon inside the soils, you will have a capacity to reduce, in fact, the impact of emissions. And uh, to, do, to, to go down that path, to do down this uh, way, you have to increase yields and also to uh, help to have a cover of soil all over the year. And at least, but not uh, at least, the sector is only contributing to lower emission from other sectors, that has been also said, uh, through petroleum substitution by biogas, biofuel, biochemistry, 
uh, taking into account, of course, the impact of indirect land use change that should be taken into account. So if you take all this leverage, it le normally, if we are sensible, it will say that we need to produce more and better, and it is directly in line with uh, the challenge that we have on the world level to feed the growing po world population, and not less. So to go down this way, we of course need, first of all, innovation. Uh, we have been conducting in France quite a large survey on what should be the main innovation in order to reach uh, these goals. The uh, main technological innovation is of course genetic. We need to improve genetic and the, with the use of new, new, new breeding techniques. We need to improve digital and robotics in order to be able to enhance precision farming and, digi and digitalization in, uh, in the farming world. We need to improve biocontrol. Biocontrol can be a solution in order to reduce the use of pesticides, even if we know that it will be uh, during a long time a combination between chemistry and biocontrol that should be the, the, the solution uh, to uh, have a good control of uh, various diseases uh, on animals and also on plants. And we need also uh, to, to work on agronomy itself because we need to, to have a better resilience of the farming, of the farmers, of the farms themselves uh, with uh, the necessity to adapt to the climate change. We have this pool of innovation, so that means that we have some policies that go, should go down this way. And we have always to take into account that in order to change the, on, on a large scale the comportment of farmers, you have always to take into account that you have to find a good balance between the constraints and the necessity for the farmers to make benefits and to be, to be able to invest in the, the, the innovations and to move forward. So it is always hard to find how we can have a policy that just take into account that the constraints should be always at a certain mm -hmm. level that maintain a certain level of competitivity in an open market with the balance with the financial uh, support that can be done by the, the policies in order to be able to, have, to sustain these constraints and then to have incentivized policies in order to, to give the possibility to farmers to go down the good practices that are uh, well known now. So that's the main difficulties that we are facing nowadays. Clarify the goals that you will give to agriculture to produce more and better. Give clear expectation of what, you, what they have to do, because if you take the, the views from the farmers themselves, we have some now big plans on the EU level, on the world level, on national levels, on bioeconomy, on the climate change, on energy transition, ecological transition, biodiversity. So that means that you have plenty of rules, constraints that comes to the farmers, and they need to take that into account in order to have a sustainable way of <coughs> making farmers, of farming. It is very complicated. Many times there is not a consistency within the various politics, and at the end, uh, it's not also worth for the farmers because it hurts their competitiveness, so they are not able to live, to, to give, uh, to earn uh, revenue uh, in income out of uh, their activities. And uh, also, on the other side, they are simply not able to produce in some times when they don't have any solutions. So we need to have a more systemic view on the system in order to push the farmers to meet the expectation of society and to clarify the consistency of the policies and to have clear goals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let's presume, because I think it's, it's true, that, that farmers want to, to tackle climate change. No farmer wants to be uh, caught short uh, by the effects of, of climate change. Um, but farmers may feel that they are hampered by policy rather than uh, assisted by it. Do you think that's fair? It's clearly the case. Uh, the general feeling is that you have a full range of constraints which are giving uh, the general <coughs> feeling that they never reach a point where what they're done is just recognized by the society. If you take 
nowadays uh, general surrounding in France, apart from the Yellow Vest movement, uh, is that you have organic farming, where it seems now that it is the only solution that has to be provided, and the rest is conventional agriculture, and even if the farmers are doing quite a lot of things for the many years in order to improve their mode of production and their impact, it doesn't have any repercussion on the public and either on the market itself. So this general feeling is very, is very <coughs> bad. And uh, of course, we need to, to find another way. So how can we regain control by the farmers on their future? That was the main discussion we had in France within our, our association. How can we rebuild the confidence with the citizens and the consumers? How can we give a clear view of what we expect from them in order to satisfy the, the, the market and also to have a good uh, earning on their, their activities? So one way was to try to, to think about what are the specifications? What kind of specification that we can give to the farmers that either can be uh, satisfying the expectation of citizens and consumers, be able to, to be uh, judged as positive by the policy makers and the government in order to have a politic of support instead of defense, and uh, how it can also be uh, the source of value inside the branch organization in order to have value added on their products. In France, we have developed quite a while ago uh, certification on environment, environmental certification. We call that high value environmental. It's clearly a label. It has been built <coughs> by the stakeholders. That means, uh, that means with, with the consumers, with the farmers, with the industry, and with the NGOs also. It's a full range of rules that is based on biodiversity, water, so quantitative and qualitative issues, uh, use of fertilizers, but also the use of uh, pesticides. It's based on the certification by a third party in compliance with international standards. And uh, it's on a free level, free level system. And at the end, you can put a label on the products themselves. So we decided to move down to this environmental certification uh, because we, we wanted to clarify a little bit the specification for the farmers so they know exactly where are the expectations, what they have to do, what will be the control system. And we expect from this certification on one stage to have some support by the polit politics itself. For example, in the CAP policy, we are fighting in order to have a recognition of equivalence when you have a certification which is uh, validated, of course, by the policy makers that it, you can reach a system, of an uh, environmental aid system, very easily, like the eco scheme that it is on the table, for example, nowadays. But also to implement this kind of uh, evolution, you need innovation, you need investment, so you need the politic of investment to go down this way, so you can have a policy like that. And on the other side, it is the beginning of a branch negotiation inside the economical organization in order to put forward how we can, with traceability, build up a trust up to the consumers in order to show that the production modes are in, in, in line with their expectations. So it is possible through this kind of certification. It might clarify the debate. It is a way to move a little bit because, as it had been said very early, we know what we have to do. It's how we can move together and en masse movement from the farmers themselves. We need confidence and we need consistency in policies. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think you may have been slightly disagreeing with some of that. <laughs> slightly. Slightly. I mean, it's always interesting because well, you, when we are waging legislative battles, it's a bit in abstracto, but when I listen to you, then I remember that our opponents have a face. What I hear from you is basically we should continue. We should do more of the same. Bigger farms. No. We should go for the global markets. I heard you saying competitiveness. That is basically the driver. So wheat sector. If you, the, the reference of the wheat sector is the global price. So the farmer will need to be competitive. And of course, if you compete with massive farms in the US or in, in, in Russia, 
Well, we have to do the same. So monoculture, by the way, uh, unobstructed land, so no hedges, no trees, to wh whatever, drive through Champagne or the Beauce in France, and you will see what I mean. So no biodiversity at all, so fertilizers, uh, herbicides, all the rest of it, so that we can compete. And since you don't earn so much, you need a bigger farm. So automation, mechanization, more oil. That's basically what you say. Yes, that we should be a bit careful about what we use in terms of oil and fertilizers. No, it is not a paradigm shift, what you're talking about. It's more of the same, just more of the same. We should m innovate more, and technology will bring us the solution. I'm an engineer, you know. I know the limits of technology. I know the laws of thermodynamics. I know what chemistry can do for us, and I, I know what it can't. The reality is that basically what you want is to avoid a paradigm shift. You want to defend the business model that is driven by the landowners, the big ones, that is driven by the financial sector, that is driven by the cardinals of this world at the expense of farmers. And some farmers who would like to move out of that sector are prisoners. Why? Because they entered it and they got indebted. And once you're in that machine, there's no easy way out. Don't be surprised that so many are committing suicide. And you might say, no, it's only a small percentage. But this is still too much. Why is it so? Because they feel prisoners. Prisoner of a system that basically you keep defending. And so, well, I know who my enemy is. bring you in at this point. <laughs> I thought you wanted to reply from the farmers, but on, I think on, on our side, I would agree that uh, we cannot continue business as usual. I think we all agree. There's no disagreement. No, 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 no. no. There's disagreement. No, I don't think there is disagreement on the diagnosis. I don't think you can objectively disagree with the fact that seeing the situation of climate change, even the business sector, if you look at Davos, the, sure. Oh, the sure. three, the three. That was, that was, I'm sure. Let me let me mention some global inequalities and all that. If the you rest look, of it. if you look at yeah, the people yeah, sure. in Davos, and you ask them, what are the top three risks for business? More money. The top three risks for business in the last World Economic Forum were climate change, environmental damage, and extreme meteorological phenomena. Sure, sure. This is the business sector from Davos. So I don't think there is disagreement on the challenge that we are facing. Sure. I think the question is how radical and how ambitious do, are we? And what we are saying is that business as usual will not deliver. And what we are saying is that the fastest that the agriculture sector adapts and the more ambitious that the proposals that the Commission has put on the table are adopted, and by the way, we were very disappointed with the discussions in Parliament because we were expecting that the Council would water them down, but what came out of the Parliament more was not very encouraging. We were expecting that the parliament would come with As you know, higher we're in the ambition. minority in parliament. It's easy to blame an institution. You know that there's different opinions I'm in not, that institution. I'm not blaming any institution. No, 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 no. I'm, You're I'm playing a subtle game, no, well, I'm not, not so subtle game. I'm not blaming any institution because the parliament has not yet voted. But I'm saying, no, no. I'm saying the discussions in parliament so far have not yet given to higher ambition, as I we agree. were expecting. So in this situation, we need to step up the ambition. We need to go for a more sustainable agriculture. What we have put on the table is a way to get rid of unsustainable practices, to go for more coherence between the policies, and something very important, which has been mentioned, to reward, can, uh, to create incentives to farmers who provide ecosystem services. Because this is the way in which we have to go. We have to reward the provision of public goods, and I think we have to go in the direction that when a farmer is contributing to sustainability, this is, a, this is a service that he's providing to the society that has to be rewarded. And we want that if this, these proposals are agreed by the institutions, we can come quickly and more urgently to more efficient actions. But we commission but proposals. Do we, stop, do we stop production subsidies? Do we, do we cap payments? We need to we need to adapt ah, the, voilà, to the adapt. payments. We need yeah, to change yeah. the common agricultural policy. The house is on policy. fire, and we need to adapt. Fine. Fine. And I, I want to say something also. It is very difficult to justify for the budget from the, from the taxpayers' provision that we are devoting one third of the budget yeah. to the common agricultural policy if it is not radically changed. 
Well, that's a, a, a perennial problem, but yeah. thank you both for that. And although we disagree, we can all be nice to each other. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 Of course, we, there is always a more of a caricatural way of presenting things. Uh, the movement that we are putting forward is not business as usual, because when you try to change your mode of production, your crop rotation systems, you can use innovation, and innovation and progress is not systematically negative for humanity. I think definitely it's exactly the contrary. And we can have, for example, in genetic research, we can have many, if many benefit effects in order to highlight the, the resistance on uh, drought, on the resistance on certain disease, nutritional issues. We have plenty of innovation that can come out of these new breeding technologies and that will help farmers to solve adaptation to ch climate change, but also respond a little bit more to, uh, to the needs of the society. We have digital issues and robotics is not a matter of size of a farm. It's just you'll be able to more to evaluate a little bit more what's going on the outside and to be able to rapidly act on the thing and to bring the right dose at the right place at the right moment. The general effect is to how can we maintain a good control on the impacts of a farmer's mode of production instead of building up new and only a mode of production on the philosophy of the systems. That's what we think. We think also that with certification, traceability, we try to push up a segmentation of a market in order to create value and to respond to expectation of society and to respond also to the evolution on how f the people are willing to feed themselves in the future. So it's a general movement and we need to s policy that to support that, of course, I didn't went through, but we need some new financial tools. Uh, financial tools, of course, with land acquisition is always a big problem for next generation, but also how can we finance the services, economical, ecosystemic services? How can we reward sequestration of carbons? All these aspects, plus the market, may at the end an income for the farmer. And between, we can have a combination with all of that, and we can reach something on the market. We defend a model of agriculture based on family capital. It's not exactly a matter of size and not to just replicate what has done before. We know that with innovation, we can move down forward. We can have something rely to a more respect of what the final, the final client wants and try to create value out of it. That's a more practical way of seeing things. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Leslie, you'd like to come in with that? Yeah, um, I think what, what comes out a lot of um, what Jean-Marc was saying and what can get lost really easily when we're um, looking at these um, massive challenges, which we all agree <laughs> we need to act on yesterday, um, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the human aspect. And I'd like to go back to the, to the um, justice angle um, from, 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 sev from several perspectives. So firstly, there's the common sense intergenerational one. There will be uh, no food on a, on a, on a, on a dead planet. So we, it's simply not an option of um, making our farming and, and food systems as sustainable as possible, as quickly as possible. But um, I got, I've got a lot of sympathy with farmers who are um, facing a, a, a perfect storm in a way. Um, globally, we'll have to be feeding a, an increased population who are demanding an increasingly um, resource-intensive diet. Um, and the, the Lancet's um, uh, diet for the planet um, um, initiative, which came out earlier this year, I think is really interesting, um, looking at the um, uh, components of different um, um, food sources that um, can be sustainable if we all had that kind of diet. Um, a shrinking area of arable land, um, so 30% of arable land has become unproductive since the middle of the 20th century. Uh, poor quality soil, so land degradation is also an issue. By 2050, if we continue business as usual, um, up to 95% of um, land could be degraded. Um, depleting topsoil and smaller yields from the land that is still remaining. So it, it's really hard. And I think with a lot of um, uh, unsustainable sectors, we have this idea of a just transition. So for example, in the fossil fuel energy or mining industries, particularly in the UK, um, my organization, IPPR, has recently released a report looking at a just transition for the north of England, which has been heavily um, hit by um, post-industrial um, uh, economic and social issues. 
So I think, uh, yeah, farmers really need to be supported and taken along in this process. We can't just um, expect them to um, magically fulfill all these expectations on their own. But I also want to look um, beyond the EU because um, it's not just the EU that's facing these issues, but it's also not uniform uh, across the globe. So um, those most exposed to the effects of climate change and environmental breakdown are often the least responsible. So um, uh, the bottom, the, the lowest earning half of the global population are responsible for 10% of global emissions, and the exact opposite is true. So the 10% 10, 10 richest globally are responsible for half of annual emissions. Um, uh, Middle East and North Africa is particularly exposed to um, uh, climate change um, effects, but 99% um, of um, those in uh, global south countries who are hit by um, extreme weather events, often related to climate change, 99% um, of the um, property that uh, is lost in those um, are uninsured. 99%. So it's not it's not an even picture um, uh, across the globe. And the EU really is a, a set of um, wealthy nations that, um, as we've seen, needs to get its act together internally, but also needs to be willing to um, play its part in the global um, the global effort to um, become sustainable, just, and prepared. So many EU countries currently have a, 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 an ecological f footprint of 150% of what the planet can sustain. Um, and so um, our current system isn't working for the environment and it's not working for humans. Um, so, uh, and I think that speaks to um, Philippe's point about the need for um, a paradigm shift. And I think what's really interesting about the developments in the United States for a Green New Deal is that it marries social justice and economic justice um, with the um, radical action that we need um, for uh, climate change. The only thing that I'd say about the Green New Deal is it also needs to talk about the prepared. The, so we've got, it's got the sustainable and just, but it needs to be prepared. Sarah, Jessica Parker, if you will. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. It's a very important point there to bring in uh, social justice. Um, I would like to invite our audience, because I think we've got a few uh, questions here. I can see, where, we've, where have we got our microphones? Because I can Thank see you. there's a Many gentleman questions. here who's had his hand up, and one here and here. Very good. I'm going to take a, uh, a, a few at once, because we've had a very stimulating discussion here. There was no danger of uh, peace breaking out. <laughs> um, so uh, I'd like to invite uh, a few questions or statements at once. Yes, we, we'll, we'll come to you, sir, and you, sir. My name is Michael Zalm. I'm a land-owning farmer, Mr. Lombard, so I think land-owning and farming goes very well together. Can go together. I lease out land and I lease in land and I did it all my life organically. But I'm not interested in ideologic uh, discussion. I'm interested in practical solutions. And that's what I'm asking for. Where are the practical solutions for better life, better fighting climate change? And we might change the rules. And one of the rules is carbon trade. And I would like to, because that's an economic solution, and I would very much like to learn more about that. Okay. And adding to carbon trade, there's also the question of forestry. The use of wood products, of bioproducts, should be forced, should be economically valued, should, should be part of carbon sink, using timber, for example. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a few questions at once. So that was, that was a very good question. But for the sake of speed, there's a, there was a question in the middle here, there. If you could have the microphone here and then at the, at the back of this segment here. Yes, I uh, will come to you. Well, Van Montague, University Ghent, Belgium. It's to Mr. Lambert. Uh, 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 yes. Where are you? Oh, I can ah, stand pardon. up. Yeah, okay, it might be easier, yeah. Um, I, I appreciate uh, that you are an engineer, and I think it's uh, very important, uh, the scientific approach. And, uh, in the not inanimate world, it's very clear, and nobody will contest it. But I'm afraid that it is not only during the speech that you fell asleep, but that it's 30 years that the green movement is asleep and men are not seeing the real, what the living world is and what the signs of the living world is. Most of the points that you take uh, is ideology, is yeah. absolutely not science-based. Oh, yeah. and, the, and the points... Global markets. Uh, and the points... Uh, <laughs> 
and the points that you mentioned, how society reacts on the problems that are there, the problems are very real, and I appreciate Potash, well, what um, Mr. Potashnik said. Uh, and all the uh, scientists really f see how can we apply in a world that always was in ideology, only very, very recently, some science came up in the inanimate world, and now uh, we have to apply it in agriculture. And there, if you had not fallen asleep, you would have heard about the importance of biomass, the solutions that are, uh, sure. that are there. But I didn't dispute that. What are you yeah, well, talking about? I didn't dispute this. Thank you. Can you? Yeah, yes. Well, the, the, I, I, that's I you the fact the that you dispute it. Uh, I didn't dispute yeah, it. Listen to what I'm saying. Yeah, sorry, this isn't a conversation between you two. Thank you. <laughs> can we have the microphone up there? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Alan Buckwell, Rise Foundation. Commissioner Cagnetti made it quite clear uh, in his presentation that, that agricultural emissions can't be reduced to zero, that, that agriculture inherently produces uh, uh, greenhouse gas. We've, the, the task is to minimise it, and as people have said, there are plenty of ways to do that. However, what's missing in this conversation, except uh, Leslie Rankin, I think, referred to it, is are we prepared to move on consumption? Uh, is the concept of sustainable consumption an empty idea or is there something real here? Let me put the question more concrete to the panel. Uh, what steps do you think Europe should be taking to encourage reduced meat consumption in Europe? Thank you very much indeed for that and a, a healthy dose of scepticism there about uh, zero emissions. We have a, a question here. Hello. I'm, I'm taking a few questions at once, but you can... Yeah, my you, name is... Not Phil. everyone has to answer every question. Sorry, yeah. So my name is Felipe, I'm, for, I'm the founder of Renature Foundation. I'm in behalf of the Fought for Food community. And uh, so my question is that we are working with a lot of projects on agroforestry and regenerative agriculture worldwide, developing showcases of uh, commodity production for cacao, coffee, like palm oil, soybean. And we're seeing a lot of like impact on carbon. For example, there's 12 tons of carbon per hectare per year that it can sequester more than actually conventional systems, as well as economical viability. It's showing that in cacao production, agroforestry produces three times more, mm. 1,200 kilograms per hectare per year, while a conventional produces 400. Why? Because it needs shade. So my question is to the panel, uh, why are we are not investing in these regenerative agroforestry practices, uh, which there's a really few support, and how can we enhance that throughout Europe and um, uh, in, in other countries which are suffering a lot from deforestation law? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. That's a very useful contribution there. And I'm going to take this question finally from this gentleman here who's had his hand up. Thank you. The, the microphone's behind you. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yes, I'm a retired person. I have a simple question. Why can't we establish a carbon tax that would function like VAT? That means when something is coming into Europe, it will be taxed on its carbon footprint that can be scientifically measured through the processes that have been used. Conversely, when in Europe we are exporting, you have a carbon neutralization system because you export without the carb a carbon tax. So the technique exists right. and the, all the administration exists. The second question is, if we establish a carbon tax, why can't we help farmers with the proceeds of this tax to shift their way of producing and producing locally for local markets and the other thing I would like to say is that when I was young, you had mill, windmills, and you still had windmills and water mills, and you had processing locally on low carbon systems. Yeah. Right, that's, that's yeah. my question. Thank you. Why not count tax carbon yeah. and give it to, to, to farmers? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that, that, that question also ties in with our first question about uh, carbon trading and why can't we have carbon trading. So I'm going to put those questions to you. Why can't we have carbon trading and carbon tax that would aid farmers? The reason why we, have, we do not have a carbon tax in Europe is because there was not an agreement to have it. We have an emission trading schemes, mm -hmm. which is... But emissions trading doesn't necessarily Or emission trading, and, uh, but 
but we do not have, uh, we have not had so far the majority, well, we need unanimity for tax measures, so we have not had the agreement of what the maximum we have succeeded is to have an emission trading scheme, which we are struggling also to extend to other sectors. I was at, in some time in my life de dealing with aviation. We were fighting to persuade the rest of the world that this was a scheme where they should participate. Mm -hmm. But I think intellectually and rationally there is no objection. Mm. And there is no objection that the proceeds could be directed to the agricultural sector if that were established or to the sectors that contribute to reducing CO2. In fact, this is now done with the, uh, with the emission trading scheme. We have been within the emission trading scheme uh, working with the allowances to try to increase the price of the ton of CO2, but we have not yet reached that. Okay. I, can, I would like to answer the question on the agroecology because there were questions for our other colleagues and then I think one of the important features, and I would like to thank the, several of the speakers, one of the important features of the proposals of the Commission, to which I was referring, is that they introduce a brand, a new innovative element under the first pillar to provide subsidies to farmers to complement their income to the provision of public goods. And agroecology, uh, uh, organic farming, landscape features, permanent grasslands, will have the possibility, the possibility to be rewarded. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is something which is extremely important because it is an effort to show in the direction that we need to have more sustainable practices and that farmers that contribute in this direction should be incentivized mm -hmm. and that they should be rewarded because they are providing, to, they are providing public goods. So it is one of the important features which is included in the Commission's proposal, together with the conditionality, because we will subordinate many of the subsidies to the compliance with environmental objectives, with water, with nitrates, with uh, uh, Natura 2000, biodiversity, with the involvement of the environmental authorities in the elaboration of the plans, and also with a new set of indicators that we have to establish to ensure that these results are credible. Lovely. Sorry. Thank you very much, and you make it sound like a beautiful and rational system. Thank you. Um, Philippe, um, just okay. to give your, your answers to those questions, I'm, I, I'm, we, we, we're running a little bit short of time because we had such an interesting discussion. Uh, if you discussion, want to skip me, no problem. You, huh? <laughs> I'm giving you your opportunity to respond. Now, I understand that the room is quite di divided uh, and <laughs> polarized. And to some in the room, when they hear inconvenient truths, they call it ideology, so they don't have to answer it. I didn't use any ideology. The fact that we have a largely production-based cap is fact. The fact that birds are dying en masse is fact. The fact that insects are dying in en masse is fact. Mm -hmm. The fact that farmers commit suicide more than many other segments of society is fact. The fact that we have seen an explosion in use of uh, fertilizers and herbicides is fact. It's not ideology. These are the facts I'm fighting. And the fact that the, 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 the fact that the global that, that for the agricultural sector, the global markets are the norm, the yardstick, the goal is fact. And I, I, I would say it's even ideology. Because it is driven by this idea, which is purely ideological, that global markets are by definition the most efficient way of organizing society. So if you want to call inconvenience facts ideology, then I'm a bringer, I bring you ideology. But I'm afraid to say that these are facts. Now, as to carbon price, I totally agree that the ETS system has been inefficient. We have given emission rights away for free, right? So we have created a business for steel makers, cement makers, and the rest of them. And by the way, the net result of our ETS system has been first a carbon price that has been close to zero, and now, okay, it's a bit above zero, so it be, it's becoming a bit relevant, but the net effect has been that we have just displaced our CO2 emissions out of Europe to the rest of the world. If we, we factor in consumption, then we realize that really few member states have had 
even a slight reduction of CO2 emissions. Only five of them, I think, have seen a net reduction of the CO2 emissions. So should we move to carbon price? Absolutely. But then, and well, I, I see that you want to shut me off, no problem. I will just say one thing that if you want to go in the direction of carbon price, and that means indeed, as you said, a sort of environmental VAT, if you just add that layer to the current taxation systems, which are by and large anti-redistributive, totally unjust, don't be surprised that you get the yellow vest. It's only normal that they stand up. So doing that without a deep revision of our taxation systems, in terms of much more redistrib well, progressivity and making sure that you factor in uh, capital income at least as much as work income, well, unless you do that, we won't be successful. So just saying let's add ecological taxation on top of all the rest of it is a no-go is, is no area. So we need a deep revision of our taxation systems and I'll, I'll leave you. the rest to others. Thank you very much. I'm going to give one very, very last word to, to Jean-Marc because we've got to wrap up yeah. here, but just your very last final response. Just, just, a, just a small reaction. Of course, the second session of carbon and the way you can uh, find a way to, to, to make a return to the farming on the farming level is a very important question. Uh, as you know, uh, the, the capacity of sequestration is something that it is not working very well nowadays and it can be a complement of a revenue for the farmers. So we need to work on this issue, but at least the price of carbon nowadays is not worth enough to, do, to go down this way. So when I was speaking about new financial tools, of course it was how can we better remunerate uh, this uh, sequestration of carbon inside forest and agricultural practices, but also how can we can take into account the ecosystemic uh, systems and the services around to the society. We are working a lot on that. Some are already available for farmers, and we should, in the next future, try to enhance the system. So. Thank you very much indeed for that. And thank you to all our panelists. I think that's been a very sparky session, uh, I, I would say. Um, I think uh, there were a lot of questions there. I hope at least some of them have been answered, and it certainly provided a great deal of food for thought. Uh, I'm just going to remind you that we're about to break for coffee, uh, but if you could come back here for 11.30 sharp uh, for the next session, uh, and if you could just, before you go on your way out, say thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.